Great. Let's start the first session, which is on the role of household heterogeneity for the transmission of um, fiscal and monetary policy. And the first presentation is going to be by Laura, right? Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for including the paper in the program. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, fiscal multipliers and small open economies with heterogeneous households. Um, so the, the title is the program, essentially. This is joint work with my former colleagues from the University of Copenhagen. Um, yes, and let me get started without further ado. No. Oops, sorry. The clicker is slow. Here we go. So what we do in this paper is um, revisit a classic question in macroeconomics. Um, we want to investigate how effective fiscal spending is. By effective, we mean um, how much of an output boost can we get from um, a shock in government spending and government consumption, essentially. Um, now, obviously, there's a large um, both empirical and theoretical literature on this topic. Um, and what our jumping off point is in this paper is um, the, the consensus or the results from the closed economy theoretical literature um, that's been established in the past um, that fiscal multipliers um, tend to be relatively large in um, a heterogeneous agent new Keynesian setting um, because of strong income effects essentially compared to the corresponding representative agent setting. Okay, so in those models um, households that are credit constrained tend to have relatively large marginal propensities to consume, which makes fiscal policy comparatively more effective than in a representative agent setting. Um, what's not been systematically investigated and what we ask in this paper is how this result or this, this view carries over to a um, small open economy setting. Um, this is not clear a priori, uh, we think. There are several reasons to believe, for example, that fiscal multipliers might in fact be smaller um, if we look at a small open economy hank model compared to a small open economy rank setting. Okay? Um, for example, um, if we move to an open economy, um, part of um, an increase in aggregate demand um, that translates into an increase in private spending um, would not actually translate to an increase in domestic production, but spending is in part on foreign goods, so that would tend to reduce the fiscal multiplier. Secondly, any increase in aggregate demand that there is um, would be affected by relative international relative prices, and so to the extent that real exchange rates appreciate um, following fiscal spending, um, we would expect that to lower net exports and also reduce fiscal multipliers. Um, Okay, so based on this, um, what we're doing in this paper is um, investigate this systematically, essentially. Um, what I'm going to show you today is that we can identify six distinct channels um, that completely shape, characterize, describe um, fiscal multipliers in a small open economy hank framework and the corresponding rank setting. Um, and I'm going to discuss those. We'll see that they tend to pull in opposing in different directions. So from those, it's not clear whether um, heterogeneity in open economies makes fiscal multipliers larger or smaller. Um, informed by this decomposition, we then are able to show that there are some, some equivalence results, essentially. So we're able to show that under some parameterizations, um, it turns out to be the case that fiscal multipliers are exactly identical in the two settings. Okay, so under some parameterizations, heterogeneity um, doesn't matter at all for fiscal spending in open economies. I'm going to discuss this in detail, but the key factors shaping this, um, shaping the relative size here, are related to openness, um, the, the degree of openness of the economy, so how much of spending is on foreign goods, as well as the trade elasticity, um, how substitutable are foreign and, foreign and domestic goods, um, as well as, to some extent, how spending is financed. Um, okay, so all of this we show in a relatively stylized setting. Then we also want to know whether this translates to a more quantitatively realistic framework. Um, so we extend our model and show that in our um, benchmark calibration, um, as well as in, under a number of um, different parameterizations, um, we find that fiscal multipliers generally are fairly similar across the two settings, okay, in open economies. Um, in terms of numbers, what we find is that the, in a setting with heterogeneity, so in the small open economy hang setting, most fiscal multipliers are around 20% larger than in the corresponding rank setting. Uh, this is in contrast to the closed economy results where they can be twice as large, roughly, okay? 
um, impact multipliers tend to be around one, we find. What we also highlight, however, is that the transmission is different across the two models. Um, and in particular, uh, in um, the Hank model, what we get is that we do find a strong consumption boom in response to fiscal spending, um, but that that tends to be offset by a net export drop, leaving the overall multiplier relatively comparable um, to the representative agent setting. Okay. Um, there's a large literature on this, which in the interest of time, I'm going to skip um, and instead start uh, by showing you the stylized model um, that we have in the paper. I'm not going to show you equations and instead talk you through the model. If there's questions, we can go um, to the details later. Essentially, the framework that we have here is an incomplete market uh, version of the canonical Gali Monacelli small open economy model. Um, it's quite similar to this Eau Claire, uh, 2021 paper. Uh, our households face idiosyncratic income shocks and borrowing constraints. Um, so they're heterogene heterogeneous uh, in, in, um, in equilibrium. They consume a CES bundle of foreign and domestic goods um, with an elasticity of substitution eta and openness uh, parameter alpha. So share alpha of income is spent on foreign goods here. Um, I'm mentioning the notation because I'm going to be referring back to that um, in the next few slides. Production here of output is linear in labor, um, and we assume sticky wages, which gives rise to a new Keynesian wage uh, Phillips curve. Exogenous government spending, so this is the shock that we're going to be looking at, um, is financed with a mix of debt and taxes. In this setting, we have a simple tax rule that a certain fraction of the spending is tax financed and the remainder with debt. Um, and monetary policy has, follows a, a real interest rate rule. Um, that here responds only to output with um, this parameter phi y. Um, and it doesn't respond to inflation. We generalize this later in the full model. The foreign economy is very simple. We don't have to specify much here since the, our home economy is small. Um, so all we do is specify um, their demand for the domestic good, um, which is according to a CES demand function. In terms of asset markets, um, we have a UIP condition um, implied by no arbitrage that pins down the real exchange rate or changes in the real exchange rate as a function of real interest rate differentials. Um, okay, and then the only difference compared to the um, heterogeneous agent version of this model and the rank version is that in the representative agent setting, we have a standard Euler equation um, with uh, full risk sharing among domestic agents. We still don't have international risk sharing. Um, all right, what we do, um, the, the shock that we're looking at is a small perfect foresight fiscal policy shock as a standard. Um, and we consider what's called the sequence space representation of the model. Um, that means that the key objects that I'm going to be referring to here are these um, infinite dimensional vectors of perturbations of variables from steady state, denoted by dx here. Um, and so you can think of these roughly as impulse responses to the shock that we're looking at here. So what I'm going to be showing you next and what we're interested here in is dy, the change in output in response to the fiscal policy shock that we're looking at. Okay. Um, so this output response, um, we're summarizing in proposition one in the paper. Okay. We can decompose um, how um, output changes after this fiscal policy shock into the six different components. The first component um, is the direct effect from higher government consumption, uh, which increases output directly just via goods market equilibrium. Okay? Um, that channel is independent of household behavior, so it's going to be the same across the two frameworks. The second channel um, is a tax channel um, that puts a, a drag on the response of output, so a drag on the fiscal multiplier. Higher taxes reduce spending. Um, and they do so more in the Hank model than in the corresponding rank model because these agents have high marginal propensities to consume. Um, so this tends to make the multiplier smaller in the Hank setting. Note also that um, we're in an open economy. Um, and so the size of this effect is scaled by the degree of openness of the economy. Um, the larger, the more of spending goes up to foreign goods, the smaller of a drag this channel puts on domestic production. Um, 
The third channel um, that determines the output response um, is an interest rate channel. Um, so your standard intertemporal substitution effect. Um, if the real rate increases, as it tends to uh, in the setting, because output goes up or it tends to go up, um, then households are going to increase savings, reduce current consumption um, via intertemporal substitution. So this will tend to reduce the fiscal multiplier as well. This effect tends to be larger in the rank model and smaller in the hank model. Okay. So this goes in the opposite direction as the as the previous channel. Fourth, we can show that the Keynesian multiplier um, contributes to the overall output output effect. Um, this works in the way that higher output, an initial higher output impul impulse means more labor income, which in turn implies higher consumption and therefore higher output. This tends to be, this tends to increase the fiscal multiplier and more so in the Hank model than the rank model um, because marginal propensities consume are large. Now, the last two channels are only present in an open economy. Um, we can see this by um, if alpha is just equal to zero, then these drop out. They measure the extent to which output responds to changes in international relative prices. Um, the expenditure switching effect captures that if real interest rates increase, um, and therefore the real exchange rate tends to appreciate by UIP, then this is going to, so this means that this term here is negative, then domestic goods are going to be more expensive um, and um, reducing the boost we get from the, from, on, on domestic output. Um, it's not a priori clear whether this tends to be larger or smaller in one of the two models, um, but it turns out that it's actually a larger drag on the multiplier in the Hank setting because there we have the additional multiplier effects that are not present in the rank setting. The final channel that determines the output response here is a real income channel um, that again is larger in the Hank setting. Um, a real exchange rate appreciation is going to increase domestic purchasing power and therefore increase um, domestic demand. Okay, so the upshot from all of this is um, that there are these different channels and that they pull in opposite directions and it's not clear um, whether fiscal multipliers are larger or smaller in one setting or the other. So it's a quantitative question and we want to investigate um, what determines their relative size, if we can say anything more about that. Um, we next provide a couple of equivalence results showing that under certain parameter restrictions, um, the, the multipliers are exactly identical in the two settings. Um, I'm going to start with uh, what we summarize in Proposition 2 um, that ties this to openness. So if we're considering our government spending shock, um, we can show that the entire path of output and therefore also the fiscal multiplier, however you want to measure it, is exactly identical um, in an economy where um, alpha tends to one, so in other words, where um, the economy is fully open and all spending, all private spending, is on foreign goods. Um, in that case, we can show that the, the effect on output um, is zero if monetary policy is active, so if it responds to the stimulus, um, and exactly equal to the fiscal stimulus if it is passive. So in that case, we get a multiplier of one. Why is this? What's the intuition for this result? Well, um, in a fully open economy, the Keynesian multiplier is essentially shut down. Um, there's no effect of an increase in um, private consumption demand on domestic production. Okay, it goes fully to foreign goods. Um, then the only thing that can still happen is uh, crowding out via net exports if real, rate, real rates rise, so if monetary policy is active, if it's not active, um, output rises by exactly the stimulus, but nothing else. Um, okay, so openness um, is an important driver in determining the relative size of these multipliers. We can um, show this in a slightly uh, modified and slightly more restrictive um, equivalence proposition uh, re relating to the trade elasticity as well. So if we're considering, again, our government spending shock, um, but now also assume that monetary policy is active, then it turns out to be the case that the fiscal multiplier is identical, regardless of whether you have heterogeneity or not, if the trade elasticity is infinitely large. Okay. Um, in that case, multipliers are zero. So this is, this is essentially the, the analog of a fully open economy um, and active monetary policy. In that case also, 
um, what we get is full crowding out via net exports. The real exchange rate appreciates, um, and um, the impact on domestic production is zero. Um, it's slightly different from the previous proposition in that there's still spending on domestic goods. So we also get a small drag from the tax channel in um, the heterogeneous agent version. Um, but expenditure switching is the dominant factor here. Okay. Um, now, the, um, the, the final um, equivalence result that we're able to show in the paper is um, that there's a trade-off essentially between um, openness as measured by the trade elasticity and the financing of the, um, of the stimulus. Um, so we can show that um, if government spending in addition is um, financed period by period, so if the um, size of the stimulus is exactly equal, is, is fully, fully, is, yeah, is a balanced budget increase in spending, um, then multipliers are identical if the trade elasticity is equal to one, okay? In this case, we can solve um, for this analytical expression for it. Um, and um, yes, exactly. What happens in that case, um, the intuition for what happens in that case is similar to the previous two propositions. Under this calibration, what happens is that with um, a unit trade elasticity combined with our log utility assumption, we get um, no effect on net exports of this increase in government spending, um, essentially because the income and substitution effects from any changes in the real exchange rate completely offset each other. Okay. Um, so essentially, we're, um, the economy behaves as if it's a closed economy. And in that setting, um, it's been shown in previous papers, and this extends to our setting, um, that the aggregate effects um, under this balanced budget assumption on consumption and therefore also on output are identical regardless of whether you have heterogeneity or not. Okay. This suggests that there's a more general trade-off between the trade elasticity and financing that shapes multipliers in this setting. Um, we can show, and now this is not analytical anymore, but numerically, that that holds true in our setting. So if we, instead of balanced budget financing, assume more generally that we can have a fraction of the stimulus, phi g, paid for by taxes, we're able to find um, a value of the trade elasticity such that the present value fiscal multiplier is identical in our two settings. Okay. Uh, we show this graphically. Um, where you have the trade elasticity on this axis over here, the degree of financing over here. Um, and what I'm plotting is the difference in this present value multiplier, um, hank mi minus rank. Uh, red areas of the graph means the rank multiplier is higher. Green areas of the graph means the hank multiplier is larger. The black line traces out the combinations of the two parameters such that the two are exactly identical. The previous proposition established the point down here, um, trade elasticity of one and full financing, where the two are identical. Um, and we can see that if we um, move in either direction, there's a trade-off between the two, we can still obtain equivalence. Intuitively, for um, any given degree of the trade elasticity, if we move towards higher financing, so more, more tax financing, we get a stronger tax channel from our decomposition, um, and that tends to reduce the multiplier and hank because hank agents respond to increases in taxes more strongly. Um, on the other hand, for a given degree of tax finance, if we increase the trade elasticity, so if people are happier to switch to foreign goods, um, we're going to get more of a drag from this expenditure switching in the hank model. And that again reduces the hank multiplier compared to the rank. Okay, um, now um, we want to know whether, so this, the, the stylus model tells us that um, there's no fixed ranking in multipliers between the two settings. We want to know what this looks like in a quantitative model. So that's what we turn to in the second part of the paper. Um, what we add in order to make this quantitatively more realistic are the following elements. Um, we have permanent discount factor heterogeneity that allows us to match not just um, marginal propensities to consume, which we do in the stylized model, but also realistic government debt levels. 
We add time varying trade elasticities um, because they tend to be in the data, the empirical evidence is shown, so they tend to be relatively low uh, initially, high later. We generalize our monetary policy response. We now have a Taylor rule that has interest rate smoothing as well as an inflation response. Finally, we add a fixed cost in production that lets us match both um, realistic markup for firms and um, a realistic aggregate wealth to output ratio. Our calibration is for a small open OCD economy building uh, on our own previous work. Now, um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss the calibration in detail. Um, we can come back to that if you're interested. Instead, what I want to show you uh, are our main, so our main quantitative model results, um, the impulse responses from our government spending shock. So what you can see here is um, the fiscal stimulus. Government spending goes up. Um, here you can see the, the GDP response, so domestic production. The solid line is the Hank model. The dashed line is the rank model. Um, what you can see is that they're pretty similar. Um, so in the quantitative model, we find that there's no big difference in fiscal multipliers across the two frameworks. In terms of numbers, um, when you compute this, we get an impact multiplier in the Hank model of 1.1, 1 .1, uh, the rank model 0.91. In present value terms, after 20 quarters, um, the Hank model has a multiplier of 0.36, uh, rank 0.39, so they're still pretty comparable. Um, they're slightly smaller because the output response is less persistent um, than the GDP, uh, sorry, than the, the government spending impulse. Okay. What this picture also shows you um, is that the transmission is different in the two frameworks. Okay. So if you look at the consumption response, we get a strong consumption boom um, in the Hank framework and a drop in rank. Um, similarly, for imports, we get an import boom um, and a drop in the rank model. Combined with a relatively muted export, or no difference in the export response across the two frameworks, that translates to a net export deterioration in our Hank setting, net export increase in rank. Okay. And so the consumption boom and the net export drop basically offset each other, leading to the relatively comparable GDP response overall. Um, government debt increases, according to our financing um, rule. Real interest rates rise after an initial drop. That's due to interest rate smoothing, and we get a real exchange rate appreciation. Now, um, we, in the paper, we have a number of robustness results and different features of the model where we try to investigate how, how robust this is and if, it, if the result changes um, depending on different model ingredients. I want to show you two of those um, to help shed light on the mechanics. The first is um, alternative financing assumptions of the shock. Okay, In the baseline model, um, or yes, alternative financing assumptions of the shock, so we can assume anything from a balanced budget uh, fiscal stimulus to fully debt financed. Um, and we look at a total of four different assumptions on this that have been investigated in the literature before. So that's what I'm showing you here. Um, each row is a different type of financing. Um, you can look at the last column that shows you the response of government debt to give you an idea of how much of this is debt financed in the particular setup. First row is balanced budget increase, so government debt doesn't move at all. Um, and then we have increasingly strong um, debt finance, okay? The first column um, shows you the GDP response, um, and the main message is across Hank and Rank, the two lines still lie pretty much on top of each other. So quantitatively, the degree of financing doesn't make a dif big difference here for the relative size of the fiscal multipliers in the two settings. The reason why this happens, um, you can glean from the center two columns um, that give you the consumption response and the net export response. So you can see that with increasing degrees of debt finance, the consumption boom gets larger and larger in the Hank model, because there's less and less of a drag from taxes. But at the same time, um, the net export deterioration gets stronger and stronger. So again, it's this offsetting effect of the two that net out to a roughly unchanged fiscal multiplier across the two models. The last um, uh, experiment, I guess, that I wanted to show you is um, looking at um, how what role the real exchange rate plays um, in, our, in driving our results. There's um, an empirical debate 
about whether the real exchange rate appreciates or depreciates following a fiscal response, uh, fiscal stimulus. Um, and while it will go beyond this paper to take a firm stand on what's the right answer there, we do want to investigate um, what happens in our setting if we have fiscal stimulus combined with a real exchange rate depreciation instead of the baseline appreciation. Um, we try to look at this in a relatively ad hoc way by adding a UIP shock, so just a shock to our UIP condition, um, and use that to generate um, different real exchange rate responses combined with the fiscal shock. That's what's shown here. So the first row gives you our baseline response that I've shown you earlier with a real exchange rate appreciation. Here um, we get the fiscal stimulus with a UIP shock such that the real exchange rate is completely unchanged. In the bottom row, we get our fiscal shock with a UIP shock that leads to the mirror image of our baseline result, um, so a real exchange rate depreciation by the same amount. Um, again, output is in the first column, and so you can see that regardless of what the real exchange rate does, it doesn't affect the fiscal multiplier very much in the setting, especially not the relative fiscal multiplier between the two different settings. Um, in, and again, like before, this is driven by consumption and net, export of set, net exports offsetting each other. Um, in the baseline, we have consumption boom, net export deterioration. Um, as the real exchange rate either doesn't move or depreciates, um, we get the mirror image of that. So consumption then deteriorates and net exports improve, um, but the offsetting effect remains the same. Okay. Um, no. Let me, that's all I wanted to show you for today. Um, let me conclude by what we've shown, what I've shown you today, what we do in this paper. We've shown essentially we wanted to investigate um, how important openness is in uh, determining the relative size of fiscal, fiscal oh, sorry, how important heterogeneity is in open economies in determining fiscal multipliers. We show um, that they can in fact be identical um, across Hank and Rank settings in open economies under certain conditions. And that in a quantitative setting, they still tend to be pretty similar and around one on impact. Um, in terms of the channels that determine them, we show that tax financing and in particular openness tend to reduce multipliers in Hank settings. Um, and we highlight that the transmission is different across the two, set, the, the, the two frameworks. So um, Hank in particular is going to predict a consumption boom, um, but an offsetting net export drop import boom. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Laura. Um, the discussion is kind of okay. Thanks a lot uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss this uh, very interesting and uh, insightful paper, uh, which was. I think very well explained by Laura. So uh, what the paper is about, it looks at the fiscal multiplier and it compares systematically the small open economy Hank model, heterogeneous agent, new agent version, uh, with the rank, the rep agent version of that model. And it, as you saw from the presentation, it does so in a very systematic manner and I think that's most welcome. The result, the upshot is, and I'm very sympathetic with that message, is that Hank doesn't make much of a difference for the multiplier. Okay, so I think that's a bit welcome. That's I welcome this result, you know, because sometimes I have the feeling we are somewhat overly excited about the Hank business. So uh, Ralph, I'm I'm learning from Ralph about Hank. So, but uh, still, at some you know some dose of uh, skepticism, I think is is still uh, warranted. And, and, and what's, uh, what's uh, but it's surprising. It's surprising in light of Eau Claire's uh, result, a very influential paper, intertemporal Keynesian cross paper, where they stress uh, that, uh, where they get the result that uh, in closed economy, hang, uh, you get much larger multipliers. So, so the question is what kills the hang effect in the open economy? And I think it's one way to put this here is it's monetary policy. Yeah? It's monetary policy, and you see this uh, through some knife edge results, which Laura also presented, and on which I will focus in my presentation. But before going there, let me stress it's a very nice and elegant paper. It delivers insights in open economy fiscal transmission beyond tank, 
and it completes our picture of open economy fiscal policy in a sense. So before I go there, let me take a step back to set the stage. Yeah? And I want to go back to Mandel Fleming for a reason which becomes clear later. Also, because I'm always fascinated by this result when I teach, even at the graduate level, open economy macro. This is taken from Mencu's undergraduate textbook, to be, to be clear. So Mandel Fleming, in its most simple vintage, the key thing here is we have perfect capital mobility. So interest rates are given by world interest rates. And so the first equation here is money market clearing. So you have exogenous money supply equals money demand. There's the world interest rate, R star, and then there's Y output. So what this does, it pins down output. If money supply is exogenous, output is given. That's important to understand fiscal transmission open economies, also in the present paper presented by Laura. But let's look at the second equation, which is the uh, IS equation. And now we can see what happens in response to fiscal policy. Yeah? So let's say you increase government spending. Output is fixed from the money market, given money supply is exogenous. So when you, uh, investment is fixed because the world interest rate is fixed. So the, the thing which has to give is net exports. And this comes about by exchange rate adjusting in the background. And the upshot is you get a zero multiplier. And that's what I find exciting. Yeah? So you have a zero multiplier. Government spending crowds out net exports, and it crowds them out completely. So there's 100% crowding out. And to hammer home this point, you know, which you're all familiar with, I borrowed this graph from Mencu textbook. Yeah? So here you, you just see graphically what's going on. There, there is the vertical LM curve, which fixes output. So you push up government spending, meaning you push the IS curve to the right, and then the exchange rate appreciates, and that creates this room for this additional spending when output can't move, 100% crowding out of net exports. Why is that interesting? I think you know this always got me excited, and I, I had a hard time squaring this with the prediction of the new Keynesian model, where openness doesn't matter so much. And in light of this, I found the results which Laura presented very exciting. Because the two, present, uh, two of the propositions uh, which she presented were speaking directly to this. So proposition two from the paper looks at the case where in their model, there's no home bias. So it's a fully open economy. The limiting case alpha being this home bias parameter going to one. So the guys in this economy consume only you know, goods produced in the rest of the world. It's a small open economy after all. Yeah? And then you get this very sharp and intriguing result that the multiplier is either one or zero, yeah? nothing else. Uh, and it depends on monetary policy. And I reproduce here the rule which they are considering. It's this real interest rate, rule, which is a bit of a special rule, as you will see. So it packs the real interest rate. And then on top of that, potentially, it also responds to output. OK, and then in sequence space, you get the result uh, in pro of this proposition, which shows you the sequence of output in the representative agent version of the model, RA, and in the heterogeneous agent model. And you get the sequence of government spending. So the top thing is when monetary policy does not respond to output, on top of packing the real rate, then the multiplier is 1, exactly 1. And then if it responds just a tiny little bit, you know, just non-zero response to output, you get a zero multiplier, just like in Mandel Fleming. So what's going on? The paper explains this a little bit. So it says, OK, real interest rates go up, and that causes appreciation, and that in turn crowds out. And that's why you get a multiplier lower than one. But why is it complete? Why is it 100% crowding out? That's not so clear in the paper, I think. And I want to explain this in my discussion. And there's a similar result for Proposition 3, where they take the trade elasticity to infinity. And then, you know, with that slightly aggressive monetary policy, you again get a zero multiplier. So I want to understand these limiting cases because I think they are very instructive and insightful, in particular in light of this Mandel Fleming stuff. Then I will talk a little bit about openness in the multiplier and conclude with a big picture. Let me also say that I won't talk about the empirical issues. I mean, there's a host of well known empirical issues. We understand that these models have a very hard time accounting for real exchange rate and uh, net exports responses. And I wasted like the best part of my academic life understanding this with limited success. So I won't talk about this today. OK, so here, let me let me focus on these two limiting cases. Why is there 100% crowding out? And to understand what's going on, I take the Gali Monacelli model plus government spending, which I use in teaching. Yeah? So. Sequence space representation, all fine, but I think you know you can also learn a lot by just staring at these two equations. Uh, 
uh, which I present here. So here's risk sharing. So that's uh, domestic consumption. It's tied to S, which is the terms of trade. Yeah. So, you know, in Laura's notation, this would be Q here. But so this is, I think, a one way to look at it, which is helpful. Because if you take the home bias to be completely absent, so you set alpha to one, making it a completely open economy, then you see that consumption uh, is completely insulated. This is just risk sharing. If all countries have the same consumption basket, consumption doesn't move. Now, that's intriguing because if there's also an oil, uh, oil equation, uh, and that Euler equation, if you see that government spending is, is pinned down by the risk sharing condition, and then you substitute in the Euler equation this monetary policy rule with that potential response to output, then with consumption fixed, then the Euler equation pins down output. Yeah, so that nails output, and then just, in Mandel, just like in Mandel Fleming, you have net exports acting as the residual, which has to, have to be, you know, give completely to stabilize output at zero. Yeah, so you get 100% guarding out. Okay, Ralph is pushing in terms of time, so I, you know, you can do, apply a similar logic uh, for this uh, third proposition. I will, I will skip that, and I will also speculate here only briefly that a general insight applies to the Hang model too. I suppose, with in the absence of home bias, with complete openness, you have um, domestic in, domestic income of the high MPC guys, if you want, insulated from demand, from domestic demand, because domestic demand all flows abroad, demand leakage. And then you still have an oil equation for the you know guys who will sit on the oil equation and they, with the real uh, output target in that very special monetary policy rule, you get output completely insulated. So I think that's, that's a very interesting result. But it also uh, testifies to the importance of monetary policy in getting there. So now I want to briefly illustrate, you know, take up the issue of openness, because if you look at that proposition, you walk away and you think, OK, openness is so important for the multiplier. While my experience tells me it's not. To illustrate this, I run through that Gallimonacelli model running a few simulations. I guess most of you are familiar with this. So this is a, um, a closed economy rank. Yeah? So in the, you have government spending expressed in units of GDP. So this is a, the upper right panel is the output response, direct measure of the multiplier, which is 0.7. Yeah? Now let's make this economy open. What happens? nothing right in terms of multiplier because here i'm looking at that traditional you know reference case with unitary trade elasticity which is used a lot since gali monacelli nothing changes with openness yeah trade balance doesn't respond we can change this we can make the trade elasticity a little bit larger to three which is actually quite a bit large in terms of macro literature then you see the multiplier comes down impact multiplier from 0.7 to 0.5 uh not too impressive uh, I would say you can also go to 100 in the spirit of Laura's proposition 3, and then you get the zero multiplier and uh, the trade balance declining. But I should also say trade price elasticity of 100, we would never use in, in macro models, of course. It's more a theoretical curiosity. Okay, uh, so I think what's missing in the paper in light of this is a systematic analysis of openness, because the model is, I think, very detailed in comparing rank and tank in an open economy setting, but it tells us somewhat less about how the predictions in um, hang change as you move from closed economy to open economy. So we only have the Eau Claire et al result in the background. We know multipliers are large there, but we don't understand really how openness uh, changes. Okay. And this is where I want to leave it with this big picture. So here you have uh, rank and hang, you have closed and open economy as a kind of summary where I see the literature here. So we understand in rank multipliers are, you know, just below one. In the closed economy, this is because consumption is crowded out because the intertemporal price of consumption goes up in response to government spending. In the open economy, we have very similar result from, say, Erzsek Linde, I think, were the first to make that point. I'm not sure. Uh, but so they, they you also have consumption crowded out and because the intratemporal price of consumption goes up. Yeah? Now compare this with Hank. Yeah? So what the paper, I think this also shows you, hopefully, the, where I see the, the value of the paper, you know, it fills this important gap here by just clarifying what's going on in the open economy Hank thing. And we understand, we learn from the paper that the multiplier is about one. Uh, and that's quite um, different from what we know from closed economy Hank. And the paper is very, I think, uh, good in contrasting here this, uh, where differences come about between these two cases. What I like the, 
the authors to do a little bit more is, you know, introducing systematically openness starting from here. So we really see what's going on as we move from top to bottom. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Gernot. Let's move on to the next paper, given time, um, and that would be Jan. Um, you have 30 minutes. Okay. Good morning. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizer. I am very happy to be here to present you this joint work with Charles Labousse and other PhD students at Paris School of Economics. And this work is entitled Balance Sheet Policies and Central Bank Losses in an ENC Model. Sorry. Okay, so in the last decade, we had a very low interest rate in the euro area and we had balance sheet expansion. The blue line is total, de total debt, total public debt held by the euro system. And the idea of the paper is very simple. We want to decompose the effect of balance sheet policies into three phases. The first phase is the expansion phase. During the zero lower bound, I'm going to emit reserves, to create reserves, to purchase assets, to purchase public debt. At the end of the zero lower bound, we have the loss phase because suddenly the interest rate is positive again and then the central bank experiences big loss. Finally, on the long run, we have the normalization policy, which means maybe we will converge towards a new steady state with a smaller or bigger balance sheet. So we will have or not quantitative tightening. So we want to answer the general question, what are the effects of central bank balance sheet policies? And we want to break this very difficult question into three little ones. First, at the zero lower bound during our first phase, can quantitative easing stimulate the economy? Is quantitative easing not whole, or can we increase consumption, inflation, even in the liquidity trap? Second, when we exit the zero lower bound, we may experience losses. So what is the fiscal transmission of these central bank losses and how to cover them? And finally, on the long run, what could be the effect of quantitative tightening? What would happen if we decide to sell the asset uh, we bought during the zero bound. So of course, quantitative easing is many things. So today, in this paper, we will focus on the fiscal and monetary interaction of balance sheet policies. And we will try to convince you that, yes, QE may be efficient to help banks or firms, but the main point of quantitative easing, in our understanding, is the fiscal channel, because we'll have a very interesting interaction between the treasury and the central bank through profit and losses of central banks. So just a preview of our result, we'll find that yes, quantitative easing is useful to stimulate the economy. We will have an increase in consumption, output inflation, and this will be due to a decrease in interest rates in our model. But this non-neutrality will be due to three main distortions. First, we will have distortive income tax. We'll have distortive taxation. So we'll have a very important fiscal channel of quantitative easing. Second, we will see that as quantitative easing modifies portfolio of households, the imperfect capital market will be key to generate the effect of quantitative easing. So we'll have a liquidity channel. And finally, on the long run, we may have an inflation tax because QE will modify the path of inflation. And as inflation will be distortionary in our model, this will affect the economy. So just to explain these channels, suppose we have constant public debt, a government with constant public debt. And suppose the central bank buys part of this public debt. In this case, central bank holds more assets. So the central bank will make more profit. These profits will be transmitted to the government, so the government will have more revenue, so we will have a fiscal effect of QE. So as the government has more revenue, uh, I can increase public spending, I can lower existing taxes, so it may have a positive effect on the economy. But at the same time, if central bank holds more public debt, households hold less public debt. So they have less assets to self-insure. So we will have a decrease in the real interest rate. And the real interest rate 
is a, a debt burden for the state, for the treasury, will have a decrease in the repayment of the debt. So this will be positive for the government and again have a positive fiscal effect of quantitative easing. Finally, if households hold less public debt, they have less asset to self-insure, so they are more at the borrowing constraint. So since they cannot have a negative position in assets, they will decrease their money demand. So we'll have a decrease in the money level and then a decrease in the inflation tax. But at the same time, if you have a decrease in real interest rate, then we'll have an increase in money demand, like in ISLM, so I will have an increase in the inflation tax. So we don't know the sign of this effect, but what is sure is that we will have a change in the inflation tax and again a change in the government revenue and then again the fiscal effect. Okay, so these are the three channels in our model. But yes, we know that QE is not not all. But this will crucially depend on what the size of the expected future central bank balance sheet. And in fact, this will be the key of the presentation today. will show that the anticipation of agents about the new future central bank balance sheet are crucial to understand the effect of QE today. And we will find that QE is efficient if central bank losses have a low effect on treasury balance sheet, which means that we will uh, look at the fiscal transmission of central bank losses. I'm going to take some water. Sorry. Okay, so we have that QE is not neutral, and this will depend on mostly the size of the balance sheet expected by agent and the fiscal transmission of central bank losses. So when I talk about central bank losses, I talk about the following. Here in blue, you have profit of the Fed and in red, profit of the Bank de France. As you see, in the last decade, we had sizable gain for major central banks. And the black dot is the remittance to the treasury. This means that in the last decade, we had big gains for the government, for the central bank, and big remittances to the treasury. But last year, we had big loss for the Fed, for the Bank de France, for all major central banks. And as you see, we have no negative dot, which means that the government is very happy to take the profit of the central bank, but the government is not very happy to take the loss. So if the central bank makes a loss, it has to deal with the loss by itself. And in this case, we have an asymmetric transmission of profit and gains of the central bank. And this will be crucial in our model. So this is for France and uh, the United States. But in fact, last year, for all central banks, we had big losses from 0.5% of GDP to 1.5%. So it has a sizable effect. And we will see that it's very important for the transmission of quantitative easing. Finally, we will find that the welfare gains of quantitative easing, because they exist, are very heterogeneous and unevenly distributed. We'll find that, in fact, our channel of quantitative easing is progressive, which means that it increases labor income, which is good for poor people, but it decreases capital income, which is not good for rich people. So, in fact, we will find that QE is progressive and benefits mostly poor people. Okay, so to answer this question, questions, we will construct a theoretical model. In this model, we will have firms, households, central bank and government, and households and central banks. So on the household, we consider heterogeneous agents. We have a classical ANG framework or IAGRI framework. So we have an household maximizing utility, choosing consumption and labor. The only difference is that we have money in the utility function. And money enters the utility function with a satiation point. Without the satiation point, we cannot reach the zero dollar bound. Because if we don't have the satiation point, this would mean that at the zero dollar bound, money yields utility and then dominates the assets that yield no utility, which is not possible. So we have money in the utility. The EDD function with association point, 
and I maximize my utility given these three constraints. I consume, save in public debt, save in money. I have my asset return, my money with no return, net labor income, and profits. I cannot borrow. I have my idiosyncratic productivity shock. So it's a very simple framework for households. The only thing that matters is the money demand. Here, the money demand from households depends on the satiation point on consumption and interest rate. So same as in the ISLM model. But it also depends on the borrowing constraint multiplier. Why? Because I cannot borrow in assets, in public debt. So I need to decrease my money level to self-insure against idiosyncratic shock. On the firm side, it's very simple. We have a new Keynesian block. So we have a firm maximizing its intertemporal profit, subject to price adjustment cost, monopolistic competition, and this yields the Phillips curve. On the government, it's also very simple because we have a government that must repay interest rate on the last debt, finance public, public expenditure, and to finance these expenditures, I can create new debt. I can tax labor income, and I receive remittance for, from the government, from the central bank. This is S, and this stands for senior age revenue. So the government has a revenue coming from the central bank, and this revenue can be negative if the central bank makes losses and decides to transmit this loss. And finally, I have a tax moving rule, which means that if I have a crisis, I will have an increase in public debt and an increase in tax rate, and then public debt will converge towards its steady state value. Now, the important part of the model is the central bank. We assume that the central bank controls usually the nominal interest rate. So we have a Taylor rule, but a Taylor rule with a zero lock bound, which means I cannot have a negative interest rate. And at the zero lock bound, I unlock, in fact, new tools. At the zero lower bound, we assume that the central bank cannot control the price of money, the interest rate. So the central bank can control directly the level of money. At the zero lower bound, we will assume that suddenly I can control the level of money and I can create money or reserves to purchase public debt. So at the zero lower bound, I have a rule for my balance sheet and my money supply. And the rule for my balance sheet is the following. Outside the zero law bound, I assume the public debt held by the central bank is constant in real term unless I decide to do quantitative easing. So outside the zero law bound, I can do quantitative tightening, sorry, quantitative tightening. And at the zero law bound, I assume I keep, I keep constant my balance sheet unless I decide to introduce quantitative easing in a discretionary manner. So at the zero law bound, I can purchase assets. Outside the zero law bound, I can sell assets. And of course, if I want to purchase assets, I must print something, which is money or reserves at the zero law bound. So we assume that at the zero law bound, to purchase public debt, to increase the size of the balance sheet, I can create money. So I have the following money rule. Money is constant in real term, unless I decide to print money to purchase public debt. But outside the zero law bound, I cannot control at the same time the price of money and the level of money. So outside the zero bound, I control the interest rate. So I cannot control the money level. So money is identified by household money demand. So I control money supply only at the zero bound. When I exit the zero bound, money is again identified by household money demand and can drop, decrease, increase, but it's decided by households. OK, of course. If I print money, if I have assets, I will have a profit. The nominal profit of the central bank is the following. It's the senior, rate, the senior age revenue. If I print money, I have a revenue. And it's the portfolio revenue. The assets, uh, the interest on the last asset minus the new asset I buy today. And the last building block of this model is the transmission of this profit. We will assume two cases. The first is. The case I have shown before, which is the asymmetric transmission case, which means that we will assume that the government is very happy to take the profit, not very happy to take the loss. And if the central bank makes a loss, the central bank must emit CB securities or deferred assets, which is the X in our model. So 
the remittance to the treasury cannot be negative. It has to be positive. And if the profit is negative, I have to emit basically to cover losses. So government takes only the profit. If the profit is negative, then the central bank must emit CB securities, which will be repaid over time. But we will also consider the symmetric case, which is a treasury support case. And in this case, we assume that we can consolidate the balance sheet of the government and the central bank so that the profit is equal to the remittance. I have profit, I give it to the government. I have loss, I give it to the government. And then I never emit CB securities because my government is fully backed by my, uh, my central bank is fully backed by my, gov my government. Okay, so this is for the model. Now I'm going to show you the experiment we run. Of course, it makes no sense to talk about quantitative easing if we are not at the zero law bound. So the first thing we need to do in, is to introduce a crisis in our model. So we introduce a demand crisis in the model by shocking the preference shifter in the utility function. We introduce an exogenous 10% shock during 10 periods on the utility function of agents, which means that during 10 periods, consumption yields less utility. So I'm not going to consume today. I'm going to save a lot to consume after the end of the shock. So I will have a decrease in the interest rate. So we will reach the zero law bound. We'll have a big decline in consumption. We'll have a big decline in inflation. But so far, we assume that we have no balance sheet policies. And last thing, in the benchmark, we assume the following rule for money, which means that, as I explained before, during the zero bound, money is controlled entirely by the central bank. And if I don't purchase assets, money is just constant in real term. So during the zero bound, money is constant in real term. At the end of the zero bound, I cannot control the money level anymore. So money suddenly is identified by money demand. And as at the end of the zero bound, the interest rate is still very low, we have a big drop, a big, sorry, a big increase in money demand. So this is the benchmark experiment. Uh, this is our counterfactual. So the next graph I'm going to show you are in deviation from this one. This is the benchmark with a crisis, but no quantitative easing. Now I'm going to show you what happens if we have the same crisis, but with quantitative easing. And first, I'm going to consider a permanent quantitative easing, which means a polar case where I purchase assets in real term, I increase the size of the balance sheet, and I keep constant the size of the balance sheet forever. So I go from 10% of GDP to 20% of GDP forever. I purchase assets and I keep in real term constant my balance sheet forever. If I want to purchase assets, I must print money. So we have an increase in money. But when I exit the zero law bound, suddenly the interest rate is positive again. Suddenly money becomes dominated in return. And then agents, they have a lot of money in their portfolio, but they don't want this money anymore because money is dominated in return. So suddenly they just sell this excess money and we have a big drop in the money level. If we have a big drop in the money level, we have a big loss for the central bank. We have a big negative profit. And if I want to cover this negative profit, I must emit CB securities, which will be repaid over time. So on the short run, QE creates losses because at the end of the dollar bound, I have a one period big loss for the central bank. But on the long run, I converge towards a better world because on the long run, I, as I have permanent quantitative easing, I converge towards a new world with a permanently lower real interest rate and permanently lower tax rate, which means on the long run, I know I converge towards a better world. So by anticipation, even during the zero round, I increase my consumption and I increase my inflation. So we obtain that if QE is permanent, we have an increase in consumption and inflation even during the zero law bound. So QE is not neutral because even if we have loss at the end, we have on the long run a positive effect and by anticipation it propagates towards the liquidity trap and then I have a non-neutral QE and a positive QE even during the zero law bound. Of course, this is for permanent QE. So let's show what happens in yellow for a temporary QE. In this case, I purchase exactly the same quantity of assets, but I gradually sell these assets over time. So I do active quantitative tightening and 
I, so I have exactly the same drop in money, same drop in profit, same increase in CB securities, but on the long run, I converge towards the same steady state as before. So I have the negative effect of the loss, but I don't have the positive effect of the change in steady state. So as you see, for consumption and inflation, it's almost neutral. We are back to a Ricardian neutrality. And here we have end to mouth agents, so we don't have the Ricardian equivalent, so we have no perfect neutrality, but we have a very small negative effect of quantitative easing. So the lesson of this graph is that if agents know that QE is fully reversed over time, if QE is fully temporary, then QE has no effect and has a very little negative effect, in fact. Of course, the main question is the following. What will be the future ECB balance sheet size? Of course, I have no idea. So I can look at central bank speeches. And for example, one year ago, we had a statement for the ECB that the size of the balance sheet will not return to the level since before the global financial crisis. So maybe, maybe we can say that we will converge towards a new steady state with a higher for longer balance sheet. Or maybe the decrease will be so smooth that agent cannot anticipate the decrease. Or we can also look over time. So on the long run, uh, these are data from Ferguson and Schularik. And the blue line is the average central bank balance sheet over time over GDP, uh, the average over major central banks. As you see first, the average balance sheet is never equal to zero. It's, the average is uh, between 10 and 15%. So we won't converge back to zero. But more importantly, what you observe is that when we have an increase in the size of the balance sheet, the decrease is very gradual, which means we never observe over time active quantitative tightening, nominal quantitative tightening. We observe a tightening, but it's due to inflation, it's due to GDP growth, so it's a nominal erosion. So we observe real quantitative tightening, we never observe nominal quantitative tightening. This leads us to consider that maybe we will be something somewhere in between these two cases. This is why we consider an intermediate case, the red line, which we, we called um, partial quantitative tightening, which means that we assume that part of the QE will be reversed by QT, but part of the QE will last forever, or at least agent anticipates that this will last forever. And as you see, the effect is smaller compared to the permanent quantitative easing case, but we still have a positive effect on consumption, positive effect on inflation. Again, this is due to the permanent decrease in tax rate, permanent decrease in, int in real interest rate. So let's decompose the effect of quantitative easing on consumption. Here you have the impulse response function of consumption. As you see, the main driver in the short run of quantitative easing is the, uh, the main driver of uh, the main effect of quantitative easing on consumption on the short run is the decline in interest rate. As you see, why QE works in the short run is because through the Euler equation of unconstrained agent, the decrease in interest rate leads to an increase in consumption. So on the short run, QE is efficient because it increases it decreases interest rate and then it increases consumption. On the short run, the decrease in interest rate is not good for agent because the lower interest rate just means less capital income. So on the short run, the decline in interest rate is not good for consumption. But on the long run, we have a decrease in the labor tax rate, which compensates and more than compensates the decline in interest rate. So on the short run in our model, QE works because it decreases interest rate. On the long run, QE works because it decreases labor tax rate. Another interesting result is the following. We assume in our benchmark scenarios that we have CB securities, which means that I must emit CB securities to repay the loss. Now, the red line is what happens if I have the treasury support case, which may be the case, for example, for the Bank of England. We, what happens if we assume that the central bank gives the profits and the loss to the government. In this case, the government, to finance this loss, must increase the tax rate 
which is not good for consumption and inflation. So the main message of this graph is that if we have losses, it's better to keep the losses on the central bank side because the central bank will gradually emit CB securities and repay it compared to the government that will increase tax rate. And as labor tax rate is very, labor tax is very distortive in our model, then emitting CB securities dominate giving the loss to the government. Finally, here in our model, we have a decrease in labor tax rate. This is good for poor people, but we have a decrease in interest rate, which is bad for rich people. So what you observe here is a change of consumption uh, for consumption quintile. And as you see, for rich people, we have a decrease in, in consumption, but for poor people, we have an increase in consumption. So in our model, in our very special fiscal channel, balance sheet policy creates a change from capital income towards labor income, which is good for poor people, but it is not good for rich people. So to conclude, we find that balance sheet expansion and policy stimulates the economy on the long run because we have imperfect capital market, distortive taxation, but on the short run, even during the liquidity trap, by anticipation of this future better world, I will consume more today. But this neutrality, we can show it analytically, but the size depends on one, the expected future central bank balance sheet. If I assume a very temporary expansion, QE has no effect or even a negative effect. But if agents anticipate that QE will be, uh, won't be repaid, or it will be repaid, but in a very long time, so I don't care about it. In this case, QE may be very efficient, but at the end of the zero bound, we create big losses. And if these losses are, are transmitted to the government, to the treasury, then low the effect of quantitative easing because the smoothing rule, the repayment rule for the government is uh, is a bit more distorted because it increases labor tax rate compared to the central banks that just emit CB securities and repay it over time by uh, senior age, which is uh, a bit smoother compared to the fiscal rule for the government. So QE works and we find that welfare gains are unevenly distributed, good for poor people, bad for rich people. So QE may be progressive in our understanding. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan. So the discussing this, uh, Luigi. Yes. Okay. You can hear me, right? Yes. All right. So thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to discuss this paper, which I found very interesting. And thanks also to the uh, to Jan, who was very quick and clear. We had a brief exchange of emails, and uh, it was very clarified a few a few doubts I have. So let me start this discussion with, with a famous quote from Bernanke that uh, the problem with QE is that it works in practice, but it doesn't work in theory. Well, uh, the authors present a model in which QE works in theory. And uh, uh, um, there is a few ingredients in the model. Distortionary taxes, desire to self-insure. This comes directly from Hank. People are subject to idiosyncratic risks, uninsurable risks, so they need safe assets in order to do this uh, self-insurance, and money. Money is great, it's also a safe asset, but it comes with these problems, ZLB in particular. And the others show that they do a few QE, QT uh, experiments, and they show that what really matters is the fiscal monitor interactions. And maybe this is not surprising, but they detail and quantify this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, statement. And when I say monetary, fiscal monetary interaction, I mean that what matters is how the central bank finances its purchases and what type of losses, if any, sends to the treasury. Now, just to understand the mechanism, let me run the following experiment using their model, although the others do not do this experiment. So during the ZLB, imagine that the central bank buys some government bonds and pays with money. And these are perfect substitutes because interest rates are zero. Now we exit the ZLB. Nobody wants money anymore. People try to get rid of money. If you want to keep the price level stable, you have to withdraw money. How do you withdraw money? Well, as you could see from the presentation, there is a possibility for the central bank to issue bond-like instruments. They pay the same interest rate as regular bonds. 
And these are perfect substitutes in the hands of the public, from the point of view of the public, with government bonds. After all, they pay the same interest rates. I mean, so the regular bonds have a phase of some, a face of some prior precedent on them. This is uh, probably, I suppose, the central bank securities will have a face of some prior uh, central bank or president of the central bank on them. But that's a perfect substitute. Now, and this is the new experiment, Suppose the central bank does not repay, does not withdraw these securities, but it keeps them forever on the balance sheet. So you have an expansion that stays there forever. And because my conjecture is that this policy will be neutral. And why neutral? Well, you just swapped one asset for a perfectly equivalent asset. In fact, you, don't need, you never stop sending profits to the treasury. Why do you have profits, by the way? Well, because part of your balance sheet is financed with money, but that has nothing to do with ZLB. You always have this, uh, this money in your, in your balance sheet. Now, if this is the case, so if this policy is neutral, what this suggests is that uh, the QE, the, the power of QE depends on these profits, the profits that you stop sending, or in fact, sometimes you even send losses to the treasury. And we know that uh, this is not new. This is also in the, in the literature, as the authors uh, mentioned. There's this famous paper by Overbeck and Oxfeld that shows that, in particular in ZLB, you want to swap uh, uh, debt instruments with money because uh, you're essentially replacing distortionary taxes with seniorage which, you know, in the ZLB, who cares? But in the future, this will help, it, will help you. People anticipate that, that you stimulate the economy. But what the authors show, what the authors have in the paper, is that by doing this QEQT, by stop sending profits to the treasury, you also change the total quantity of safe assets in the economy. And this is a part of the paper that's a little bit underappreciated and underdeveloped. And my recommendation is to study a little bit more of uh, that. What, I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, total safe assets is government bonds, CB bonds, central bank bonds, and money. And I'm going to claim that the total quantity changes when you do QEQT in their model. But before doing that, let me walk you through a little bit the history of economic thought. And let me tell you uh, something about optimal quantity of debt. So we go back to the seminal paper by Ayagari et al, who show that when there are distortionary taxes and no state contingent debt, this is important, that is only risk-free, well, then following some shocks to government spending, say a war, for example, then the debt and taxes are non-stationary. What do I mean by that? Well, if government spending goes up for whatever reason this period, well, how do you repay for it? In order to minimize taxes, uh, distortions, and maximize welfare, you want to increase taxes by a tiny bit. And so, you, so the same for debt, and keep it like that forever. So essentially, debt becomes a non stationary right? The, the government spending leaves a permanent mark on debt. But much later, so 20 years later, this is the other contribution by Angeletos et al. They show that if in addition to the assumptions of Ayagari et al, you add the fact that that has a public, uh, sorry, a liquidity service, meaning that helps people self-insure, then you lose this permanent mark. In fact, debt and taxes become stationary. They converge to a long run target. Why instead? Well, you, when there is a permanent excuse me, a temporary shock to government spending, like government spending goes up, you want to increase taxes, you want to increase debt, but you don't want to do that forever. Because why? Well, because you increase the total amount of safe assets if you do so, which is great for people, but it's not great for you because interest rates go up. And they go up because people now have more safe assets. Okay, so you want to starve people a little bit of safe assets. And this is what happens in their paper. So there is a shock to government spending, and you see the dashed line is standard Ayagari et al., whereas uh, the, the solid line is Angeletos et al. You see there is a long-run trend. But now let's come to this paper. In addition to the assumptions, uh, speaking a little bit loose here, loosely here, in addition to the assumption of Angeletos et al., now we have also money demand and the ZLB. So there is a new margin of adjusting. You don't have to pay with distortionary taxes, you can also use the inflation tax. Okay, so, but let's come to uh, government spending. How does it look like? Well, the others uh, have this uh, uh, fiscal rule. So the first line here is the budget constraint of the government, that's standard. 
But the second one is a fiscal rule that tells you, tells you that taxes today are equal to some value of taxes yesterday plus the government spending, uh, excuse me, public debt yesterday. And you see that there is this rule that tells you the taxes, and so that converges to a long run trend. So it looks like stationary. And indeed, it looks a lot like Angeletto et al., which says that this is the optimal thing. Although we don't know how these parameters, where these parameters come from. And in fact, my first comment is, are the long run trends uh, targets, this tau bar and D bar for taxes and debt, optimal? Or maybe close to? And in addition, is the dynamics, this AR1-like dynamics of taxes, uh, optimal? Now, why do I care about optimality? Well, because perhaps what the central bank is doing is that it's fixing the suboptimality of safe assets in the economy, which this is not meant as a criticism. Maybe the government is issuing that in some funny way, and the central bank, by doing QE, is making it more optimal. And uh, why, do, why do I say, why, how can the central bank force or fix the amount of safe assets? Well, look at the first equation, the SCBT term, that's the profits that the central bank is sending to, or losses that the central bank is sending to the treasury. During, when you exit CLB, the assumption in the paper is that that number becomes either zero or negative, which means that debt on the left-hand side has to go up. There is more debt in the economy. Why not taxes? Well, because the fiscal rule tells you you're not going to change taxes in the current period. You have to wait one period. So you're essentially forcing the government to issue more debt. And maybe that's the right thing to do, but it would be nice to know what's the optimal uh, schedule for debt and money together now. Now, finally, I promise I'm done. The last second is that not all ZLB episodes are the same. And for example, a ZLB could be caused by a financial crisis. A financial crisis, in my mind, is a situation in which, say, private assets are not deemed safe anymore. People don't see them as safe anymore. And they, there is so less safety, less safe assets, fewer safe assets out there. Well, in this particular case, the value of safe assets, the value of liquidity in a financial crisis tend to go up. So maybe it's a good time for the government to uh, issue more government debt. Well, in this case, it's again from Angeletto et al. The first line, the solid line, the solid line is a financial crisis. Dash line is a regular recession. And in a solid line, you see in a financial crisis, interest rate goes down a lot, and it goes down a lot because, uh, uh, um, because the, the people are starved of these safe assets, right? But then the paper shows that public debt, this is the right time to issue more safe assets. In fact, the optimal thing is to issue more public debt in a financial crisis than in a regular recession. And this is about optimal debt. There is no central bank here. For what we know, both these recessions could be lead to a ZLB. So it's not about ZLB per se, it's, a, it's about the value of liquidity. Time is over? OK, so, and also my discussion is over. So thank you very much again. And uh, please read the paper. It's a very, it's a very good one.